All right. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Bible Studies with Olamide Dawson. Let us pray. In the name of Jesus, Father, we thank you for the water we drink, the food we eat, for shelter, for clothing, education, graduation, places of business and employment, work of the ministry you trusted us with. We just want to give you praise. Thank you for our families. Thank you for overcoming all the attacks of the wicked. We thank you for the born again experience. We thank you, Lord God, for the blood of Jesus, the indwelling presence of your Holy Spirit, the empowerment of your Holy Spirit. We just want to say thank you. Thank you for the Bible. We pray that as we go into your word tonight, understanding comes to us in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Praise the Lord. All right. So we have a particular direction in which we're going this evening. And uh, what I'm focusing, what I want us to focus on this evening very much is um, our perspective, our mind, our understanding of our, our, our paradigm, our worldview, what informs your worldview what determines how you see the world, because it's really very important, okay? So I want to go through some particular passages that would hit on that eventually. We start our study in the book of Romans chapter 8, reading from verse 37 to the end, and I'm teaching from the New King James translation of the Holy Bible. The New King James translation of the Holy Bible, okay? So the scripture says in Romans 8, 37 to the end, it says, yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. 13, for I am persuaded or because I am persuaded or because I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Okay. Now in this passage, I want to bring out something very, very, very absolutely profound. The scripture says that no matter what we're going through, no matter where we are, as we pursue Jesus Christ, as we follow him, that we, we overwhelmingly conquer. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Okay. Now, the love of God is something we know is there. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The famous John 3, 16. Then Ephesians chapter 2 says, God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherein he has loved us, even when we're dead in our sins and trespasses, he raised us up together in Christ. Then the famous Romans chapter 5, that God commends his love towards us. For while we're yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. Okay, now, as much as these scriptures are there, it does not necessarily mean that the individual is convinced or persuaded about God's love for them. Do you understand? They could be looking at other parameters, right, to want to give evidence to the love of God, right? But the word of God has shown us with clarity through Jesus, the Lord Jesus' death, res, um, uh, burial, resurrection, and ascension, that God loves us. Right? What makes us strong and overwhelmingly conquer, or what makes us more than conquerors in this life, is when we are persuaded about the love, when we are convinced about the love. Okay? So, like I said, the love of God is real, it is true, but it's not going to become your reality if you're not convinced, if you're not persuaded. Someone could love you to bits. If you don't believe, if you don't accept that the person loves you, then the relationship is going to have a bit of a problem. Okay? So the Bible tells us that we are more than conquerors through him that has loved us because we are fully persuaded. We are convinced about this love. Now, why I'm mentioning this is to show you the power of persuasion, the power of this mind of yours. No matter how true the realities of the Bible are, no matter how true and real the blessings of God are, if you're not persuaded, if you don't have understanding, if you're not enlightened concerning them, it will not be your consistent experience in life. That's my point. All right? So, so looking at this passage again, I want to read it again. Yet, 
In all things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For, because I am persuaded that nothing can separate us from the love of God in this Christ. I am persuaded about the love of God. If I'm in a tight spot, right, I don't lose, I don't panic. Why? Because I know God loves me. I know that God is more interested in my deliverance than even I am. If I'm in a tight spot financially, right, I don't panic. Why? Because I know that God is more interested, right, in my provision and supply and abundance than even I am because he loves me. Can you see that? Can you see how being convinced concerning God's word, being persuaded concerning God's word, actually puts you in a place of strength? Interesting. Okay? So, how do I get to the place where I can be convinced, persuaded about God's loves, God's love, God's intention, God's provision for me? Only one place, and that is the Word of God. Only in the Word of God. Church should do this for you. Your personal study should do this for you. The resources should do this for you, right? To bring you to the place of enlightenment, understanding is a better word, okay? Now, the book of Romans, chapter 12, and it's a constant thing throughout your Bible, says this. I'm going to just jump to verse 2. The Bible says in Romans, chapter 12, verse 2, it says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of, the renewing of your mind. Let me start from the beginning so we can get the point. Romans 12 verse 1 says, I beseech you, therefore, I am pleading with you, brethren. I'm appealing to you, brethren, by the mercies of God, in view of what Jesus Christ has done for you, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. It is only rational, it is only logical, reasonable, that once you begin to understand and you are persuaded about God's love for you, his mercies, you would in turn be motivated to live a holy life. It's only rational. When you, when you see what Christ has done, it, it's only logical and rational. Remember, rational and logical is mental, right? For you to not pursue him. I have seen a situation where people are not interested in Jesus because they're not exposed to what Jesus Christ has done. I repeat that again. People are not interested in pursuing Jesus Christ because they've not been told what Jesus has done. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 5 that we are ambassadors. Of, we, we, we are ambassadors, right? And we preach the message, that's right, of reconciliation, all right? We're telling people what God has done for them through Jesus Christ. By exposing people to this, it, 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 the convicting power of the Holy Spirit is there, but it also helps to persuade and convince. It gives them understanding. So, oh, this is what God has done? Okay, I'm going to reply by committing myself to him. Do you understand what I'm saying? I beseech you, therefore, in view, in view of God's mercies. That means God is not just, the Holy Spirit, the, the word of God is not just begging you to live for God. The, the word of God is telling you, see, eh, live for God in light of what God has done for you. The Bible says that we love him because he loved us first. You see that? So what does it take to love him? When we know his love for us first, the motivation and the drive to commit ourselves to him is there, okay? I don't think I need to illustrate or explain that one further, okay? Now, the Bible says, I beseech you therefore, in view of God's mercies, in view of his love, in view of all that, that he has done for you, that you live a holy life, and that you also, see, it has, the thought has not ended, okay? When you begin to look at what Jesus Christ has done for you, and begin to see his love, right? If you begin to see the cross, you begin to see the resurrection, right? Part of your commitment is not only to live a holy life. Part of your commitment is to get your thinking right. To get your thinking right. Get your thinking right. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Now, that grammar at the end simply means this. When your mind is renewed, I'll explain what that means. Let's just continue. When your mind is renewed, okay, you will not be able to prove. Prove just simply means you'll be able to walk in. You begin to give evidence to God's will. You begin to walk in God's will. If you don't know God's word, 
your conduct, your thinking will be out of place. Your conduct will be just like the world. Even if you've accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and you don't come to a place where you're learning and growing in knowledge of God's word, you will act like a sinner, ultimately. That's what's going to happen. Why? Because you don't have understanding. Your noose, your understanding now has not been affected. You're not enlightened in the word of God. Is that okay? You know? Let, let me give you an example of something. It's an illustration just to pass across the point. I've been to many, I've gone on a, a, many a condolence visits. And I've seen people lose it, man. When I say lose it, I mean lose it. Like they, they hear the person is dead and they simply, they tear their clothes, you know, in mourning and grief and roll on the ground and get all dirty. Oh my God, he's gone, he's dead. They tear them, you know. I've also been to places where, you know, where they discovered that, oh, he's gone, but he was a believer. There are tears, right? But there's also gratitude that the person is saved. What was the difference here, the mind? Okay. W one person was enlightened, understood what the Bible taught about Christians, right? Who transitioned to heaven. And when a Christian transitions to heaven, that person, you see how the person's conduct is. They will cry. They miss the person. They'll mourn for the person, but they'll also be grateful hopeful oh the person is now in a better place because that's what the bible teaches but the one who doesn't know the word of god has not gotten the word of god into their system hears of the passing of a christian and just begins to manifest high degrees of hopelessness are you are you all getting what i'm saying begins to roll around tear their clothes and everything you can see that the difference in the two is what they both understand about life and the afterlife do you understand one has the word one doesn't you see how they both behave Okay, illustration. Now, this theme of renewing the mind is throughout the New Testament, is throughout the Bible, and it's essential. But I want to show you something first. It says, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And you got to see that. You got to see that, please, eh? God will help you. <laughs> God will help you in the renew renewing of your mind. <laughs> Let me repeat that again. No, it's not a broken record. God will help you. <laughs> God will help you, but it is your responsibility. Are you catching what I'm saying? God will help you, but it's your responsibility. Okay? It's almost like saying um, when it comes to eating, um, your digestive enzymes in your stomach will help you digest the food, but they're not going to put the food in your mouth. Are you listening to me? All right? So God will help you. <laughs> God, God will help you, but it's your responsibility to pick up your Bible and read it and meditate in it. It is your responsibility to get resources. It's your responsibility to get to church and hear the word. It's, it's your responsibility to have a spirit of inquiry into the word of God to want to learn it. That's your responsibility, not God's. When you now begin to fellowship in the word and pursue the word of God to know the word of God, God will now help you by giving you revelation, illumination, enlightenment. God will help you. But God will not help you to open your, to open your Bible to read it. It is your responsibility. Did you see that? Now, this same thing, I repeat, is all over the Bible. What does it mean to renew the mind, to renovate the mind? It means that this mind can be reconfigured. Please listen to me. Your attitude can change. You can be transformed. If you are somebody who was fearful, very anxious, timid, if you get into the word of God, God will change you to become a bold, courageous individual. Are you listening to me? In the renewal of the mind, is talking about a change of your attitude a change of your ideals, ideology, the way you think. Are you listening to me? No matter how born again you are, if the way you think has not changed, how are you going to act? Because the way you act, the way you, the way you think is how you talk. The way you think is how you behave. So what, what's God doing? God needs to get the word of God into your mind. Are you listening to me? To change the way you think, to change the way you see the world, to change your viewpoint, your point of view. Okay? When he does that, you will now begin to walk according to his will in your life. Are you seeing this? Now, it's a theme in the Bible. So the Bible says you are transformed. The word transformed, we all know what it means. Metamorphosis. Okay? Everyone's going to see you as a child of God when your mind is being renewed. When you are changing the way you're thinking to be in line with the word of God, that is when the people will see that, hey, it's a child of God. Did you see that? So we read from Ephesians chapter 4. Now what I'm doing now, I'm going to show you that it's a theme throughout your Bible. 
It's throughout your Bible. Okay? It's in it, it's everywhere. It's actually everywhere in the scripture. You know? It's everywhere in the scripture. Mm. Okay, let's read Ephesians chapter 4, verse 23 quickly. Ephesians 4, 23, the Bible says this. Let me quickly get there. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. All right? Change the way you think. Adopt um, Christian ethics and values. Right? Adopt what the Bible teaches concerning that particular aspect or that particular area of your life. Is that okay? Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. God wants your mind to be renovated. God wants your mind to, your attitude to change because that's the only way your life's going to change. Transformation starts with the mind. No matter how born again you are in your spirit, it's not going to show to the world and even to you if your mind um, doesn't get hold of Christian values and ethics. The book of Colossians chapter 3, we're going to read two, two verses from there. Colossians chapter 3, verse uh, 9 and 10, the Bible says, do not lie one to another since you have put off the old man with his deeds. Verse 10, and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge, who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Renewed in knowledge. You got to know how to live. You got to know how to live. How? How does God want us to think? All right? We're still saying the same thing. The book of James, the first chapter, the 21 verse, 21st verse, sorry, says this. He says, therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Now, when he's talking about saving souls here, you're, he's talking to people who are already born again. So what is he saying? Saving. Remember the word sozo, soteria? It means to restore, to deliver, to heal. So he's talking about the restoration of your soul. Psalm 23, he restores my soul. He's talking about the changing of your attitude. The word of God implanted in you has the ability to change your attitude. It can change the way you think. Did you see that? It can change the way you think. It will enter into your subconscious and rearrange, get rid of all your fears and insecurities and everything, right? And give you strength, the strength of God, by giving you the understanding of his word concerning you. Again, you need to understand the fact that the word of God, the Bible says in the book of James, is a mirror that you look into. Because what you're seeing, right, is who God has made you. God wants you to see yourself in his word. Okay, and when you begin to see that, which we call enlightenment, right, it changes the way you reason, it changes the way you see life, it changes the way you see things, you know, because you know the word of God. Hey, there's no, you know, okay, I need some money for something, they're high cost and everything. Because you know the word of God, you don't panic because you've seen in the word of God that your inheritance, right, right, God has given you the privilege of prayer. Yeah, you see that God has given you his promise. So what you do, you just stand on the word of God, right? And you practice prayer and provision comes and fear is gone. Did you, did you see that? Did you see that? So it's important we understand that the word of God is a mirror. If you really want to see your mind um, changed, you want to see your way of thinking become you know, Jesus-like and the mind of God, you know, you got to look into the mirror of God's word. It has to be a constant practice. It has to be something that... Is constantly scheduled, you know. There's a there's there's something that who was it that said it? Ooh. I'll try and remember. Um, one of these evangelists, his name is uh, Shuttlesworth. He said that let's get into the habit of getting into the Word of God before we have breakfast. And where did he get that one from? The Book of Job. Jonathan. He said. He said. He said. I've esteemed your word above my necessary food. I've esteemed your word above my necessary food. That's like Job twenty three twelve or something. You know, so, you know, it's something that's been going around the internet today, right? Shuttles, you know, Shuttles said, let's get into the word of God before we eat. Why? Because the word of God is essential. It's essential. Yeah. It's more essential than you know. Okay. Some of us wait until we get into massive trouble before we now stand on God's promises and want to learn God's word. No, no, no. Learn it now. Yeah? I have stored up your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. Yeah. So in the book of Hebrews chapter four, 
right? We see a similar thought. Okay? Then we'll go to First Peter. Look at it. The famous Hebrews 4 verse 12. It says, for the word of God is living and powerful. Okay? Sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Okay, did you see that? So what the scripture is saying here is that this word of God is quick. It's um, not quick, not as a fast, living, it has the way, God's life in it, and powerful. If you meditate in God's word, it will get right into your subconscious and rearrange things there. Are you listening to me? It will rearrange things there. It will rearrange things. And that thing has to happen. If some of us, if all of us, don't get, get renewed in our minds, we cannot, cannot walk in God's will. If some of us don't get renewed in our minds, we won't be able to make the right decisions in life. If we don't get renewed in our minds, we won't be able to you know, recognize um, the leading of the Holy Spirit and be led by him. Are you listening to this? Okay. So finally, 1 Peter. Yeah, I just want to read this before I go on. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, right? Okay. Um, it looks just like Peter, Peter and um, Romans and Paul. It's like they're saying exactly the same thing. See what it says. Therefore, laying aside all malice, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. So Romans 12 says, I beseech you by the mercies of God that you should do this. Peter is saying, if truly you have seen the goodness of God, right, then make a commitment to do away with sin and to embrace the word of God. Start feeding off God's word that you may grow up in your salvation, grow in your understanding. Now, like I said, um, this is something that you are going to have to discipline yourself in. The Lord's power is there to help you, but scheduling your time for the Bible, making your Bible priority, principal, primary in your life is, 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 is a commitment that you have to make. Nobody's going to make it for you. It's something that God wants you to do, okay? But, hey, it's still your decision, all right? Will it please God? Absolutely. Because, hey, fellowshipping with the Word of God is fellowshipping with Jesus, okay? In your time of prayer, you're fellowshipping with the Father. In your time of prayer, praise and supplication and petition, you're fellowshipping with the Father, all right? In your time of um, heart communion and fellowship, you're fellowshipping with the Holy Spirit. Can you see that? Okay, so it's something, it's a commitment you're going to have to make because if your mind doesn't change, um, speaking personally, I used to be a, an incredibly fearful individual, you know, and also very, very, um, what would I use? Very much into myself, didn't care for nothing, didn't, get, didn't care for nobody. But in studying the word of God, I realized looking into the mirror that, hey, this is not me. You understand? This is not me. This is not me. Fear that was. The, the Bible says, do not fear. God has not given me a spirit of fear. So when the thoughts and ideas of fear begin to rise up, I say, nah, that, that, that ain't me. You see? You see? My way of thinking has changed. That ain't me. And then when people have issues around me and I just don't care, you know, I look into the word of God and the Bible talks about loving each other fervently. I'm like, hey, that ain't me. You understand what I'm saying? That ain't me. That ain't me. Just minding my own business ain't me. All right? I've got to help. I've got to love. I've got to support. Yeah? What happened? I was being renewed in the spirit of my mind. My way of thinking was change, changing which transformed my life. Is that okay? Um, please also understand, right? That repetition is your responsibility to get into the word. Get into the word and the Lord God, he will help you. Is that okay? Now, there's a passage, right? In the book of Daniel that I want, I want you to look at. Uh, in the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter nine. Yeah, well, let me read from Daniel chapter nine. And let's see something there. I find this to be deeply profound. So I'm reading Daniel chapter 9, um, verse 1 to 3. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, verse 2. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Verse 3, then I set my face toward the Lord God to make requests, prayer, and supplications 
with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession. Now, why I am sh sharing this with you in the Bible study is that there is nothing in this world outside of the word of God that is going to reveal your inheritance in Christ to you. Okay? Your understanding of your inheritance in Christ, your privileges and your benefits will only come when you crack open the Bible and understand it from the Bible. Is that okay? Now, I'm here in Africa. And of course, there are certain aspects of so-called Christianity that focus on some man's revelation, some, somebody's vision, somebody's prophecy. Very dangerous. We need to understand by the books. Daniel was reading the scroll of the prophet Jeremiah. As he read in Babylon, the scroll of the prophet Jeremiah, Daniel now saw where God had spoken to Jeremiah that, is, that, that, that Judah was only going to be in exile for 70 years. That was God's plan. That was God's will. Daniel now started praying. Lord, forgive us what we've done everything, yeah? But this is what you said, though. You said 70 years old, and that's what led to them coming back, ultimately, uh, to the land. That somebody saw it in the Bible. Somebody saw the promise in the Bible and stood on it and started praying, led to God moving to now do that will, to now fulfill that promise. Can you see that? So what I'm saying is that we all need to have Bible perspective on life. Okay? Not take things too personally. Uh, let's talk about let's talk about finances, okay? It's good for illustration. Oh, why is it always going bad for me financially? Blah, 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 blah. Open the Bible and find out what God has promised you. Come and understand God's will and God's promise to you concerning your finances and stand in prayer concerning it. Is that, did, you, did you get what I'm saying now? You, understand? you need to understand the life that God wants you to live from the Bible. You need to know your inheritance from the Bible. The privileges and benefits you have as a child of God, somebody who is in Christ, you need to see it from the Bible and not from a prophet. Are you listening to what I'm saying? So even if your pastor is preaching, right, he's going to be quoting scripture because he needs you to understand it, right, by the books. He wants you to understand it based on the scripture, not based on what he claims is a good thing or what he claims is the will of God. Because God only backs his word. There are many scriptures like that. He watches over his word to perform it. So shall my word be that goes out of my mouth. It will not uh, return to me, Okay void, but accomplish and prosper in that for which I've sent it. That's Isaiah 55, 11. Is that okay? The other one was Jeremiah 1, 12. God keeps his word. So if we want, if you watch this, God keeps, it's not a pun. God keeps his word. If you want to be kept, get hold of his word. All right? So I'm ending this evening's Bible study with a very interesting record in the Bible. And I want us to look at it. And I want you to see something very, very profound in this record. And it's a record of David and uh, Goliath, okay? Um, it's an interesting record. Yeah, it's an interesting record. I want you to see it. So let's turn to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 17. Mm. 1 Samuel chapter 17. Hmm. 1 Samuel chapter 17, let me show you something. We're talking about the mind here and perspective, okay? When we are trained in the word of God, our thinking changes. We begin to see life from a totally different point of view, a totally different perspective from the perspective of truth. And it's liberating. It's liberating. It brings peace. Do you understand? It brings comfort. It, it gives courage, boldness, faith. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah? But if you haven't been trained in the word of God and you haven't allowed your mind to be renewed, you're going to be functioning in fear. You're going to be functioning in panic. The whole world is against me. This and that, this and that. You won't, you won't know your place or your position. You won't operate from your place of victory. You won't because you don't know. You don't understand, okay? So perspective is important. Remember what we said, right? In all things, I'm more than a conqueror through him that has loved me. Why? Because I am persuaded. I am convinced, you see? So even if the love is there, if you're not convinced, if you're not persuaded here, it does nothing for you, right? So let's continue. So we see David in First Samuel chapter 17, verse 22, and I will read 
And David left his supplies. He had come to the to his dad sent him with supplies for his brothers. He had uh, altogether, he had seven brothers, right? There were eight of them. He was the last born. The first three were were with Saul, ready to battle the Philistines. But they didn't actually battle the Philistines because they were getting intimidated by the Philistine champion. So in 1 Samuel 17, 22, and David left his supplies in the hand of the supply keeper and ran to the army. And he came and greeted his brothers, 23. Then, as he talked with them, there was the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of the Philistines. And he spoke according to the same words. Basically, bring one of your guys, let us fight. You know the story, right? Simply intimidating them. And I mean, the, 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 the Israelite army were completely in fear. Okay? Why were they in fear? It's here. They totally forgot who they were. Do you understand? So David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. All right, then. Verse 26. Then David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this? Watch this. Watch this. Drum roll. All right. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Can you see perspective? David wasn't seeing it the way the Israelite army was seeing it. David was seeing everything from a totally different perspective. Number one, we are God's army. This guy's uncircumcised. What does that mean in English? What it means is that we have covenant with God. We have the Abrahamic covenant. We have the Mosaic law. God is with us. Are you listening to me? So there's nobody who can be bigger. So can you see his perspective? He, he called the Philistine uncircumcised. This guy is not in covenant with God. We are, right? So God is going to walk through us, walk with us to defeat this person. Can you see mind? And it's one of the things you need to do when you're looking at your problems in life also. You need to understand the fact that you are in Christ. 2 Corinthians, Corinthians 1.20 said, whatever the promise of God may be, the idea and amen for those in Christ. 1 John 4, 4 says, you are of God, little children, and you have overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. 1 John 5, 4 says, whosoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Verse 5 says, who is he that overcomes the world? But he that believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Come on now. Yeah. So David sees, sees perspective, very different from theirs. Those, those, those from the king saw to the whole army, they did not have the right perspective. They were not seeing this battle this war right from the perspective of their relationship with god all right so they were losing already but the minute somebody stands up and begins to see life from the perspective of their relationship with god from the perspective of what god has promised from the perspective of god's um yeah our privileges right and benefits our inheritance right um everything just shifts why did everything shift because of here fully persuaded, I'm fully convinced that God is with me on the basis of his word. I see it. What happens? Goliath now becomes Suya. You see that? Now, David, this was David's perspective. He wasn't just speaking superficially. This is what he knew. On the basis of the word of God, he knew this because, I mean, come on, the, the Torah, the, the law of Moses had been written and they were reading it. You understand what I'm saying? They were reading it and the nation was a theo theocratic nation. Do you understand what I'm saying? It was a nation established by God, and David never forgot that. But the, 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 the Saul and the army forgot it. But David never forgot. This is what they told us about where we're coming from. Do you understand? The Lord entered into the covenant of Abraham when in Egypt for how many years? God brought us out with a mighty hand, split the Red Sea, led us in, into the wilderness 40, 40 years, cloud by um, day, pillar of fire by night, fed us with manna, fed us with quail, split the, split the Jordan. I mean, before then, we defeated, you know, uh, giants and we came into the land and God gave us mighty, mighty, mighty victories. I mean, come on now. That was what David fed on. And that was what these people were taught, but they pushed it aside. Why? Because of what was in front of them. They never, never lose perspective because of what you're going through. The knowledge of God's word and understanding of his promises, benefits, understanding of the word of God is actually your strength. That is your strength. That is what will cause you to overcome. No matter how bad it may look, knowing God's word and knowing how to apply it will release God's power. Is that okay? Now, let's, let's continue. We're jumping to verse 36. I hope you're with me. First 1 Samuel chapter 17, 36. 
So David keeps on talking. Look, this guy's an uncircumcised Philistine. What, 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 what's the king going to give anybody who's going to kill him? He was speaking courageously, even as a teenager. He got to the king. The king called him, right? And David says, hey, look, don't, 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 don't be concerned. Yeah? I'll go and fight him. Yeah? So I was like, but you're a child. This guy has been a warrior since his youth. You are still a youth. What do you know? And he said, well, I have experience, said David. I have memorial. There is what God has done in my life in times past. And it's the same God. What, is my, what are my chances against a lion and a bear? Nil. But I, be, I believed God, right? And I was able to kill a bear and kill a lion who took um, one of my lambs. So this guy would just be like that. I prayed for situations in the past and God has moved. Whatever situation is befalling me now, is it not just for God to move? That's why I said memorials are incredibly important. What has God ever done for you? Stand on it. It will help you. It will help motivate you to keep on standing on God's word. Are you listening to me? Oh, we continue with the story. I said memorials are important. And Saul tried to give David his own armor. David said, I can't wear this. I've never used this before. Very important. Some of us hear of, oh, how, how, how does Kenneth Higgins pray against sickness? How does Kenneth Copeland pray against sickness? How does Shambach pray against sickness? No, brothers and sisters. It is what does the word of God teach? You understand? When it comes down to it, it's about what does the word teach? Not how did uh, some men of God do their own. No. What does the word of God teach? Practice it. Okay? Now, to call a long story short, um, David makes this statement. I'm rounding up in verse 45. And then David said to the Philistine, watch this. Please watch this. All right? First Samuel 17, 45. Then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, with spear, with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Can you imagine? See perspective. He understood what this was about. This wasn't about, you know, me and you. This is about God's glory. This is about God's promise to Israel. This is about God's word to Israel. It's not a, it's not a personal issue. Are you listening to me? This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines, the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Hmm. Interesting stuff. You can see that this man knew the covenant. He knew the word of God that God had given to Israel. And that was his perspective for life and living. Okay? Now, we do understand the fact that um, David did not kill. This, this Bible says not about David and Goliath. I'm just making a point. He didn't kill Goliath with a stone. He knocked him out with a stone. Then cut off Goliath's head with Goliath's own sword. Right? But the power in this story is that this young man recognized the covenant that God had with Israel. That was his strength in that battle, in that fight. David recognized God's covenant with Israel and he stood on it. And that's how he saw the world. We are God's people. We are God's army. You are not. You see, you see that? All right. There are other stories that, um, that, that go along that line. Every battle that Israel ever won was, was a covenant victory. Do you understand? It was all based on we are God's people against the world. Are you listening to me? Right? And it's something that we need to begin to look at. What does the Bible say concerning us as God's people? Right? What are the promises? You know, some, some, somebody says, yeah, I, I, I'm not, I'm not, I don't want this. I'm not interested in this. I'm like, okay, fine. But if you read the word of God and God tells you, this is what I, I have for you, then you're under obligation to believe it. Okay? So I want to begin to round up here. Um, we're talking about the mind and perspective. The way you see the world has to be covenant-based. You've got to begin to see the world from the perspective of the word of God. Your mind must be renewed. You don't see sickness as, oh, another attack on my family. I mean, oh, no. Well, that's what I, you don't panic when sickness comes. You don't panic when this happens. You don't panic when that happens. Why? Because the Bible says, for thine is the kingdom, the glory, and the power forever. God is with you. His word of God. His word is yours. Okay? What you need to do is to apply it. And then God will move. Is that okay? So these, these are thoughts that something I really want, want you to think about. 
Okay. I really, really want you to think about this, right? That the way you see the world has to be covenant based. And what I mean by covenant based is that you've got to begin to see the world from where you are as a child of God. Begin to see the world and deal with the world from your relationship with God. Is that okay? Begin to deal with things from the supernatural element, right, of God's word. And not allow yourself to become a victim. You're not a victim. You're seated in Christ in heavenly places. You know, like we say to Christians, right? You're not, you're not poor people trying to get rich. You guys are rich already. Do you understand? So what's happening? Well, we haven't learned how to release the power of God when it comes to favor and wisdom. When we get into the word of God, we learn how to apply ourselves in that area, right? And wisdom and favor manifest. It's as simple as that. It's okay. Now, please, I'm running up. Please do understand that there are many who don't want to accept the fact that um, our faith is covenant-based, but you need to see that the what we receive in Christ, I'm repeating myself from last week, what we receive in Christ is actually the Abrahamic covenant. What we get in Christ is actually the blessing of Abraham, in which the Lord says in Genesis 17, I will be Elohim, I will be El, I will be a strong one, a mighty one, to you and to your descendants forever. So through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the creator of the heavens and the earth, Yahweh, Jehovah, becomes my El, becomes my strong one, becomes my mighty one. Listen to what I'm saying. He not only changes my heart and gives me his nature, right? But he's here to empower me for life. And when I come to the end of this physical life, he takes hold of me and brings me into his bosom. In the afterlife, I'm with him. Yeah? I will return here or whatever. Yeah? Are you listening to me? Through Jesus Christ, I receive the Abrahamic blessing and covenant. You know, you know, it's it's interesting, right? No, I'm not, I'm not going off point. That when Abraham died, he did go to Shuel, he did go to Hades. But he was in an enclave called Abraham's bosom, where things were good. We see the story in the in the story of the rich man and Lazarus, where the rich man said, I beg, <laughs> uh, Lazarus is with Abraham. I beg, let he's, he's having fun there. Let him just dip his finger in water and give me a burning here. What's my point? Even when Abraham had died physically, God still kept him in Hades and Shaw, giving him some wonderful paradise, man, until Jesus came, died and resurrected and took them all to heaven. Did you, did you see that? Yeah, that's how powerful the Abrahamic blessing is. That's why I'm mentioning it. That's how powerful the Abrahamic blessing, even in death, God was still taking care of his covenant brother. Are you listening to me? He was still taking care of his covenant brother. So what am I saying? You need to get your mind renewed and understand the fact that Christianity, following Jesus Christ, is entering into the blessing of Abraham. Which means Father God is here to help you in this life. In every aspect of your life, you've got to learn that. Galatians chapter 3. This is the last scripture I'm quoting this evening. Galatians chapter 3. Verse 13, see what the Bible says? Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who, had, who hangs on a tree. Verse 14, why did this happen? That, or in order, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon Gentiles in Christ, that we might receive the promise of the spirit through faith. So what did you get when you, when you had Jesus? You got the blessing of Abraham. The creator of the heavens and the earth, the creator of the universe, became your mighty one, became your strong one, became your God. To guide, protect, preserve, defend, provide, and help you in this life and in the afterlife. That we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Depending on the version of the Bible you use, if you check the context of Galatians, this is actually talking about the promise that the Holy Spirit gave Abraham. 
in blessing, I will bless you. Your seed will possess will possess the gates of the enemies. Wow. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Ted, could you move, please? Yeah, but yeah, they start me in the refuge and I think it's the same refuge it will. Ted, could you mute please alright praise the Lord alright so this is where I want us to end this evening um, do we have any questions amen any questions this evening you need to you need to see and, and understand the fact that the blessing of Abraham is yours it's actually yours God, God's will, your privilege is God's defense, God's help, God's provision, God's wisdom, God's favor. Amen. Let's say like this, Angela. God, God, now God, you receive God when you receive Jesus. I hope you understand that. God gave himself to Abraham in the covenant. All right, please, any questions? Okay. Mom? Yeah, I'm here, I'm here, all right. Me? Yep. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. It's right. not really any questions, Ollie, but please have patience with me because when I hear the word, my heart is filled with joy. And I know even with Christians, sometimes they think I just speak because I just speak, which I speak. But no, when you're speaking the word, just the Holy Spirit within me, just it was like Jeremiah said, I found your word and I ate it. And it's the joy and rejoicing of my heart. So I just want to share with you that, you know, when, 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 when you were teaching and when you were sharing, just these things were coming into my mind. Just for example, David, David, who had such, you know, courage, he was a shepherd boy. He must have spent time listening and talking to God in intimacy. That's why he could come out with such, with such courage. He, he knew who he was, his God was, you know, he who dwells in the secret places, he was under the shadow of the Almighty. And when you were talking about, for example, um, about the mind, what I've been learning and I, I desire to learn more and more is to use my imagination, to imagine, just like when it says in 2 Corinthians 3.18, it says, behold us in a mirror, the glory of the Lord and be transformed into the same image from glory to glory by his spirit. And I think, mm. I, I've got to try and get this around my head. You know, and it, 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 when you share the word, it just, you know, it prompts in all of our hearts, the word, uh, the word again. And, and, and recently, uh, recently, I think even just the last few days, because I love Abraham, I love Moses, David also, but, but I always, I know I repeat it time and time again. Abraham, he grew in his relationship with God. I even got so daring to say, well, even if there are only five people in Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, will you still do this? I mean, his relationship started growing. And I've been confessing, declaring in recent days, because I love this scripture. I said, Lord, I'm just like Abraham. I don't waver through unbelief at the promises of God, but I'm strengthened in faith to your glory and totally convinced that you are more than capable of fulfilling your word. And, and, and I've been appropriating this in, in the last few days because I, 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 just, uh, I just love it. And um, uh, what else can I say? Uh, Great to God. Jesus said, Jesus said, my food is to do the will of God. So when you were talking about, you know, receive with meekness the implanted word, and then it continues with being a doer, not a hearer. I mean, I can say this, but I, I'm not where I want to be. But when I hear myself, on, you know, if nobody else is going to share with me, but so when you share the word, wow, that prompts in me, in my spirit, the, the word of God, the Holy Spirit just brings it. And when you're talking about growing, there's a beautiful, in Ephesians, in Ephesians, I think it's chapter four, verses 15 and 16, it says, you know, we all grow into... But also it says in 2 Peter 3.18, it says, grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. I just want to mm. share this because I get so excited when I hear the word. We all must get excited. And it just, it just encourages us. You know, when we share the word, we meditate and we share the word. There was one lady that I'm discipling and she gave me one scripture 
because I said, what do you want to, you know, what do you want us to do? The, 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 the book of John. She said, no, a scripture in the Old Testament. And I thought in my heart, hmm, but we're in the new covenant. But you know something? I've been hanging on to this scripture for the past two weeks. We spent one hour just with this one scripture in Isaiah. And, and it's like, it's, it, it, it's our food. It, it's man shall not live by bread alone. I appreciate the way, you know, when you share the word, I think we all should be just so, so excited, so overwhelmed, so edified, so encouraged. Thank you, Pastor Ollie, and thank you for your patience. God, God, God bless, God bless <laughs> you, man. It's, 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 um, in, when it comes to Bible reading and Bible study, I like to get people to um, purchase um, Bibles that they're comfortable with. When I say comfortable, what I mean is that um, buy, buy a Bible that feels feels good in your hand. You know, a version, of course, it has to be a good version. But what I'm saying is that buy a Bible that at least looks good to your eye. <laughs> Do you understand? Be comfortable with the scripture. Buy a Bible that the print is not too big, not too small. You know, go shopping for a good Bible. I, I, you I, I destroy go shopping. my Bibles. I really destroy my yeah, Bibles. Yeah, of course, because I you, you write in them, King you mark James, up. The New King James. And I want to say okay. one thing else also, one more thing. And I, I don't, mm -hmm. I'm not where I want to be. I want to use my imagination. Because someone said, and it's in Hebrews, Jesus himself mm -hmm. used his imagination. How come? He said he endured the cross because of the joy. Joy that was set before him. So mm. I'm not where I want to be, but when you were talking about the mind, the thinking, the seeing, Lord, teach me to use my imagination to see those things that aren't that, you know, it, beautiful, a wonderful, precious uh, teaching. Yes. Well, I, want, I want to just add something. In our hearts. <laughs> yes, I want to add something. Um, one difference between... One, one major difference between our faith and other, in quotes, religions is that, first of all, Jesus gives life. He changes our hearts. And our God, actually, the Holy Spirit dwells in our hearts. Our faith is very personal. Um, listen to this. The Lord does not expect you to walk this walk on your own. He expects to be with you every step of the way. Is that okay? Um, God, God calling people into, like, let's say, ministry, people get very prideful. Oh, God has called me to do this impossible task. Oh, can I really do it? I feel so burdened. You got it, you got it wrong. Your mind needs to be renewed. When God calls a person, he also empowers the person, and God is with the person. And, and God is with the person. Every calling to ministry is a, is a summons to participate and partner with the Holy Spirit right? In making a difference in the world. It's not about you doing something on your own. Never does God call anybody to do, it, do anything on their own. God is always with the person totally. Jesus speaking in Acts of Apostles chapter one, after he had resurrected and spent, come and gone for like 40 days, you know, he told them to wait in Jerusalem until the spirit of God came upon them. So on top of the fact that they had Jesus had resurrected. They had spent time with him. He had cooked for them. He had taught them. He told them, you're not qualified to preach until the Spirit of God comes to join you. Did you see that? We don't do this thing alone. And we have to, you see, that's why renewal of mind is important. Christian ideal, have knowledge and understanding of God's word that you are not alone. You are not meant to do this alone. This life is not you on your own. It's not. And, you know, Bible now tells us the Spirit of God dwells on the inside of us. There's nothing closer than that. To say that he dwells on the inside. There's nothing closer. There's no greater level of intimacy than that phrase. Do you understand? He didn't say it was outside you. He says inside you. There's nothing greater than that. So, brothers and sisters, you need to understand the fact that this life, you're not alone. He's your guide to death. And even after death, he'll be with you in the afterlife. All right? In this life, you have God. That's a big deal. That's massive. That's why we should always be grateful. He lives here. He's inside me. Even if I have a fever, he's right here. I, I stop my toe, he's right here. I eat some ice cream and my teeth go on edge, he is right here. A mosquito bites me, God is with me. So what we do in learning the word of God is we learn how to release his power. He wrote, the God who's inside me is the one who wrote the Bible now. So why don't read the Bible? Amen. Do we have any other questions before we go? It's about 8.30 now. 
Anything else? Any questions, contributions quickly? Just one All right. quick question, uh, Pasoli. Just one quickly. Yes. You know what it says? That it says through Christ, through Jesus. And uh, my mm -hmm. question is, why through and not in? Which scripture is that? Uh, the scripture that he gave at the beginning. Um, oh, okay. Oh, we're That's more than a conqueror in Christ, through Christ. We can do yes. all things or more than conquerors through Christ. I, I, my you know the interesting was, thing? Eh? The Bible may say... The Bible may say through in. Christ. Uh, the Bible may say through in this passage, but it also says in in other passages. Ah, it, okay. it, it, yeah, because it uses the preposition. Okay. Many times. We are yep. in Christ, right? And it is through Christ. Right? Okay. You, you understand what I'm saying? So the Bible uses the preposition in. Where, where, where are we? We are actually in him. We are in him, through him, with him. He is in us, and he is upon us. Right? Um, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost, that's the kingdom of God. The Bible says we are in God, right? And um, God is in us. We're, un we're, we're in union. We're in fellowship. We're in colonia. We are blessed. I'm telling you. He just said, let this thing, let this thing open up and let's just see how blessed we are. Maybe I, it's I, I, just the things. Maybe we go through things. We can do all things through but mm -hmm. we know that we live in and with him. Okay. Yep, the preposition is there. That's where we are. That's where we are. That's where we are. Believing in love is important. I, I am telling you all again that this mind, somebody can love you crazy. If you don't believe in it, it doesn't do anything for you. But once you begin to believe in it, it just changes everything. It gives the life, it gives the world color. Everything becomes technicolor when you're convinced and persuaded about the love of God. It goes from gray. It goes from gray to color. The minute you are persuaded and convinced about, about his love. Amen? Hallelujah. All right, let us pray. Father, for what we have heard this evening, we are grateful. We really are. What we're asking for is that you grant us the knowledge of your will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. We're also asking, Lord God, you give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. We give you praise. We give you praise. Thank you for hearing and answering our prayers. In Jesus' name. Amen.